<laughs> Alright. Welcome back to my library. I clocked myself away from like a million different games long enough to finally talk about Sayonara Wild Hearts. My favorite game of 2019. Developed by Samogo Studios and published by Annapurna Interactive, Sayonara Wild Hearts is a music-based runner game, like playing a more visually impressive temple run while listening to an indie album. Barely an hour long, so I'll likely spoil everything here. If you haven't played this yet, go do it, I promise you won't regret it, trust me. Let me give you my only real criticism of the game right here. The best way to play the game is arcade mode. It makes you play all the levels back to back. Game's short, so that's perfect. You get to listen to the whole album in one go. But you only unlock arcade mode after beating the final level in normal mode, which kicks you back to the level select after every one. This kind of breaks the pacing and adds pauses where none are necessary. This might be a nitpick, but literally the only actually negative thing I have to say. Not long ago, in a town much like yours, there was a young woman who was very happy. Until one day her heart broke so violently that her sorrow echoed through space and time. So our saga begins tonight. Yet eons ago, just here, yet light years away. You play as a young woman who, by the power of her broken heart, gets summoned into the world of the Arcana, where an evil Arcana has imprisoned the three Divine Ones. We go in Taro, baby! You already know there's gonna be a plethora of symbolism hidden away here. I love me a good game that doesn't hand you the full story on a silver platter. Luckily, as a Persona fan, I was already acquainted with the rough meaning behind each card. Like the Fool. That's me. While gaining more friendly arcana to help you in your journey, you drive, run, fly, sail and ride through five beautifully surreal worlds, brimming with color and pulsating along to the beat. The movements of the characters like a dreamlike ballet. It very much is an experience, very cinematic. With the shifting camera angles and shifting controls, it keeps you on your toes while also not overstaying its welcome. Since it's over after not even an hour. I have about 16 hours in the game if you want to do the math on how many times I've played through it. The allure of the ever higher score surely helped with that. It's fun, it's beautiful, it's emotional. And the soundtrack is great. And right away there's a nice lesson to be learned when looking at the collectibles. If you don't know which way is safe, just follow your heart. Anyways, full recommendation. Sayonara Wild Hearts is a game about heartbreak and overcoming it. As I've already said, everything is steeped in symbolism, and putting the pieces together to discover the story underneath this ethereal fever dream is its own game altogether. I found two ways to read the story of the game that make sense to me. One, which is probably more accurate since it takes all the tarot cards into account, tells a story of overcoming the heartbreak, slowly finding the strength to move forward. And another, which takes a more literal look at what's happening on screen, and interprets the happenings as somewhat unhealthy coping mechanisms by our protagonist, while she deals with her out-of-control emotions. The former is heavily influenced by an article with an analysis I read a while back, so I'll provide a link for that one. There's also a little 
extra angle you can apply to the story that I don't see brought up often in discussions about the game, but I'll get to that later. I don't think I have to clarify this, but of course I don't believe in tarot readings and stuff, but I think the cards themselves are a cool storytelling device that's not often used in media. The only representation they usually get is in the form of a single scene where someone reads the character's fortune. On their own, I, I think they're neat. Long ago, a harmonious universe existed beyond ours, and three divine arcana watched over it. But one night, a cursed arcana intersected the astral highways, and along with her star-crossed allies, they stole all harmony and hid it in their vile hearts. Before the Divine Trio started to fade, they created a heroine from the shards of a broken heart and hoped that she would one day be strong enough to save their world. We open the game, narrated by Queen Latifah of all people, with death locking the three Divine Arcana away. The High Priestess, the Empress and the Hierophant, representing intuition, feminine beauty and wisdom, respectively. Clearly, this heartbreak shook our protagonist to her core. She's losing touch with herself, she feels ugly, and feels lost. In Taro, death doesn't literally signal death. It simply represents change. An event significant enough to cause major heartbreak is sure enough to cause change, so it fits the bill. Right at the start, our protagonist is transformed into the Fool, the first major arcana, the number zero, the start of the journey. In Hate Hell Valley, the Fool summons the Wheel of Fortune in the shape of a sick bike. Fittingly, the Wheel of Fortune represents destiny. With that, she chases the Dancing Devils. Now, the two interpretations I mentioned are pretty different, and to me the real story is like somewhere in between, or a mix of both perhaps. It's really up to you at the end of the day. The Dancing Devils can be read as either representing one of the Devil's actual meanings, temptation, Or, as inhabitants of Hate Hell Valley, the fool's anger and rage she needs to overcome first before she can tackle the deeper issues. Also, unhealthy coping number one, reckless driving, not even wearing a helmet, come on now. The wo wo. The wo wo woods. <laughs> the wo wo. How who The wo wo woods, a representation of depression, stretch ahead of the fool, a seemingly endless maze of trees. Thankfully, the Emperor is here to guide her. The Emperor usually represents authority or a father figure, but it can also stand for acquired wisdom and life experience. So what I believe is happening here is that our protagonist has dealt with and overcome depression before. Her previous experiences in the form of a shining white stag are leading her through these woods to face the howling moons. The next stage is trippy, and again we can read this in different ways. It can either be the confusion the Moon Arcana stands for, or perhaps unhealthy coping number two, drug use. Probably magic mushrooms, since mushrooms play a big part in the stage. But sadly, the medication doesn't work, since you end the stage right where you started, with the representation of the fool's inner turmoil right in front of her. And right after the moon summon a pack of wolves, an extension of the moon card since they're always featured on it, a flood of emotions is coming for the fool, which she faces with justice and judgment. Here I'm actually going to quote the article, because I think phrasing it any other way would weaken the point. The Justice card has strong associations with balance, conscience and order. In tandem with judgement, which represents a final decision or awakening to a calling, we see the Fool making a decisive choice to rebalance her emotions and chase the turmoil or indecision from her heart with these tools. Finally, she defeats the Howling Moons and their giant three-headed mecha wolf. Importantly though, a three-headed wolf, a Cerberus, is the god of the underworld in Greek mythology. So with the fool defeating it, she's finally able to start climbing out of the emotional underworld. In the twilight cry sky, we meet the stereo lovers. Now with the stereo lovers, the easy way to interpret it would be to just point out that the lovers arcana represents duality and a decision to make in the journey, which is represented in the split masks, split paths and parallel universes throughout the stage. Which is accurate, but in my mind these two weirdos also make for a good analogy of an abusive relationship. 
In my mind, this could very well be unhealthy coping number three. A rushed and unfortunately abusive rebound relationship, or perhaps bad memories of a previous one. A brutal fight shows the two-facedness of the other person. After having poked the hornet's nest, the lover's subjective to a scarily accurate gaslighting metaphor, warping reality around her, which she only breaks out of once she takes control. After more fights and increasing intensity, the fool manages to defeat the lovers and move on. Desert of doubts. Guess which emotion we're dealing with here. Look at all this reckless driving going on, oh lord! When meeting Hermit64, what a gamer, they lure the fool into the VR world, which is also the world arcana, the goal of the fool's journey. Very, very clever. And also unhealthy coping number four, overindulging in technology, be it video games or social media. I lied earlier, here's another criticism. This world is boring, moving on. After a relaxing boat ride on the star representing hope, Goes down. No, it don't. It do go down. Oh! We enter a love dead city and face Little Death, the cause of all this hullabaloo. I wonder if Little Death means anything. Oh. Yeah, nah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ignore that. Here in Love Dead City, the fool has to face the source of her heartbreak. Her world gets turned upside down repeatedly. They have to face the hanged man in the shape of some flying skulls, representing letting go. They have to let go to move on. They succeed with the help of temperance, so balance and poise. And finally, we're face to face with death. Death doesn't go down easily, and starts shooting at a solid, drivable pillar of vomit. I mean, just, just like the card says, really. And ironically, of course, death doesn't die and finally incorporates the previously defeated evil arcana into its assault. The fool has to reflect on the lessons learned and one final time has to face all of them again. With love, this time. Realizing and accepting that they're part of her. All of these feelings are parts of her. She's already defeated the negative emotions associated with them. So now it's time to accept that she has only been fighting herself. With love back in her heart, it grows into a powerful dragon that leads her out of this dream world and back into reality. Then the voices of the three divine arcana echo from the beyond. And through the wind, their words soar. Not long ago, in a town much like yours, there was a young woman who fell out of love, asleep, away. For years she fell through spirals of sadness and anger until she could not fall any deeper and fell right back into her room. And finally, the bonus angle I promised, and it works beautifully together with the rest of the theory. In this game, draped in vibrant blues, whites and pinks, you play as a person in the process of transitioning, a trans woman. The initial heartbreak does not necessarily need to have been caused by a significant other, as we intuitively assume. It could also be a beloved family member or friend not accepting a protagonist for who she is. This whole angle is somewhat supported by the way the game chooses to represent 
our protagonist. At the start of the game, she looks somewhat androgynous. Most people I showed the game did actually go, oh, it's a she? Whoops. Or something along those lines when they first saw her and then heard the narration. In the world of the Arcana, she wears a mask, hiding her face, her identity away, while she's still grappling with her emotions. Finally, after returning to reality, she has fully accepted herself and adopts a more feminine look. This game is fantastic, and every time I play through, I find something new to appreciate. If you haven't played it yet, go do it. And if you have, do it again, see what else you can find. I'm sure there's more ways to interpret the events of the game that I missed or didn't cover here. And that's it. Thank you so much for watching my video. Subscribe to claim your library card and get notified when the next video goes up, whenever that might be. Sayonara, wild hearts.